All right, let's get our Facebook groups up in here before it's officially time to go. We're getting all those six days of Facebook things. I'm just ignoring those, Scott. I don't know what that means. Um, and give it a second to breathe. It's a ceremonious coffee sip. Thanks, Patrick. Ah, God bless. All right, and we're live. Welcome in, welcome in. It is the 2nd of February. Happy Groundhog's Day, Scott. Did you see your shadow today? I didn't. It's my Here's dad's mine. birthday today, so I need to call him after this. If he's not on here already, I need to call him and say, happy birthday, Groundhog. It's his screen name on a log of social media, Groundhog. That's a good one. That's a, that's a clever one. Uh, happy birthday to Steve out there, down there in Georgia. I always appreciate when he comes in and says hello. Hope you have a great one. Sorry your son's working today, but I'm sure he'll get a chance to see you when he gets back. Or do you leave today, Scott? Are you uh, packing up Yeah, after? I will watch... Um, I think I've shot about 600 clips right now. Wow. <laughs> it's it's one of those things where I feel like, sorry, I haven't done as much of the normal stuff I do, but a lot of this stuff takes some time too. It's like, this is our fifth yeah. pod since I've been down here, Nick. Yeah. Just me and you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then I've shot 600 clips and I'll get about another 250 today, 300 today, maybe. So, and then I'll, I'll leave straight from Mobile and head home. And sorry, Thomas, I'm not going to be on with you in the morning. So I need to tell him that too. <laughs> I think he'll be okay. Can run the show, and yeah, something. You, so Scott's down in Mobile. For those of you that don't know, covering the Senior Bowl, and kind of a little insider trick here: the game is going to be on Saturday or Sunday. I don't even know which day the Senior Bowl day game is. It's usually NFL, on Saturday. Saturday. Mm -hmm. Well, scouts, coaches, except the ones that are coaching the actual game itself, aren't there on Saturday anymore. They got the information that they wanted. The game is more of just a ceremonious cap to the week, and uh, you know, a little tip of the cap to the players. I mean. There's still it's it's fun for me because I'm not there, uh, but uh, so I get to watch that stuff that Scott hasn't already downloaded and uploaded. But teams are going to get a lot more from the interviews and the scrimmages and the just practice reps in general uh, than they are from the game. So <laughs> Scott's leaving before the game starts. Why would he do that? Teams are doing that too. Um, so we got Jetty's yeah. Clash coming in. 4K is time consuming. I bet. Yeah, I'm, I am shooting in 4K this year. It's not too bad on my end. I've got good equipment. I brought my whole computer down here and my big monitor and all that stuff. That's one of the reasons I drive. I was like, I might as well be here three days. I bring everything down here except my dual monitor. I do miss that. Yeah. Um, but uploading, my the, the video I posted this morning, y'all, was 3.28 gigabyte. That took three hours. I went over that one. I just loaded that one and went to bed last night. So yeah, it went in and there it does. And there he is on the on Groundhog. Say, uh, I asked, I, I said, come in on YouTube. That's where most of the conversation is. And I know he's on YouTube, uh, YouTube Mile High Huddle. Uh, I'm not sure which of the three Facebook pages he's in, but there he is. So we already said good morning and happy birthday. I will call you after the show. <laughs> happy birthday, Steve. Chat, make sure you guys say happy birthday to Scott's dad, Steve, in here. Uh, also, let's say hello to some more folks in here. Ethan, DWI guy, saying good afternoon, Jensen Broncos country. We got Dave Glassman saying cautiously optimistic. I feel like Broncos country would be wise to follow your lead here, Dave, after what we saw last year with Russell Wilson. Scott and I both like, okay, the offense won't be worse than it was last year. Foot, insert mouth, uh, but uh, it should be better this year. Uh, cautiously optimistic is the way to be. It's uh, Sebastian Dispo saying good morning. Hope you're doing well. We got Mark. Hoynack coming in saying we can dominate with a top rated offensive line. Hope that gets figured out. Talked about it a little bit last night. I am skeptical given Russell Wilson's play style that the offensive line will ever look dominant. Uh, but if they improve drastically, specifically in the run game, they can minimize the weaknesses of his game that tend to result in more pressures and sacks. I've uh, mentioned this stat before last season. So not only did the Broncos give up a lot of pressures because Russell wasn't holding the ball, but Russell Wilson was the single worst quarterback in all of football in getting rid of the football and escaping from pressures. He had the highest pressure to sack rate in the entire NFL by a decent margin. So it's, it's not just the offensive line. They deserve blame, but quarterback as well. A big one here. I think you can fix that by being better with obviously better talent, but the run game specifically giving yourself better third downs and not having these stupid procedural penalties where it's like delay a game, a uh, false start and you're already like third and 14. Duh, you're going to have more pressures than sacks when you're constantly having longer to go on third down. So uh, what do you think, Scott? Obviously, we talked about the offensive line a lot. I think you hit it. I I'm good. I'm done now. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm teasing. Uh, it, it, there's there's so many contributing factors and you went yeah. through and hit on it. One of them is the word I wanted to use on it as well was predictive. You know, you don't want to mm -hmm. be predictable on this. You know, third and 14. Yeah, you're, you're that's a sack situation. Um. Special teams. 
how much yardage were you were you backed up an extra five, 10 yards because your special teams didn't do very well when you're you're in field position battles and you're not as aggressive maybe as you would have liked because your punt returner is fielding where he shouldn't and not fielding when he should. Yeah. You know, Montreal Washington struggled this year. Corliss Waitman struggled a little bit this year punting the ball. So the one really outstanding game he had, you won a field position game against the 49ers. You pinned them in. Your offense couldn't do anything, but you were on their side of the field the whole time because your defense held them in until finally you were able to get a breakthrough. There's so much that's connected, so many little things that go wrong. I think of your whole season almost as like a 28-3. to three. Everybody wants to say, oh, it was Matt Ryan. Oh, it was Kyle Shanahan. Oh, it was this. Oh, it was that. Man, any one thing changes, mm-hmm. and, the, and the results are different. Any one out of 50 different items. Now, there are some big ones, obviously, and we've hit on that before. Yeah. The offensive line is a big one for me. The overall coordination of the offense, obviously. And then how much of that will help Russell Wilson? A lot. And then he's got to pick up his game as well and be more comfortable in his surroundings with his receivers, with his linemen, with everything. A comfortable Russ will be a much better Russ. Yeah. And uh, thank you for the comment, Mark. One other thing that I've noticed just listening to the talking heads surrounding the NFL, just hearing what you know, some of the people connected to league sources and a common theme that keeps coming up is something that you and I have talked about on here a bit, but there was a lot of a, a weird dynamic between Nathaniel Hackett and this former head coaching staff, offensive coaching staff in Denver and Russell Wilson, where Russell Wilson allegedly came in and pretty much said, this is the design of the offense I want to run. And Hackett implemented that. And a lot of people, again, more connected than myself are coming in saying Sean Payton has enough skins on the wall. That's a direct quote from Bucky Brooks, where he can come in and say, we're not running the offense that you want to run. We're going to run the offense that I think you are going to be best in. And Who's the coach here? Sean, yes, yeah, Sean Payton, 100%. And he has the authority to pull that card. And now you have buy, buy-in also, you would think, from Russell Wilson because it's been reported that Sean Payton was the coach he's wanted. There's been uh, reports in the, back, in the past about how much Russell Wilson respects Sean Payton. So this let Russ cook, empty set, 10 personnel, quick pass game, Drew Brees-like offense that Russell Wilson – wanted to allegedly uh, run, probably not going to be the case there. And I think that's great that you have a coach in here that can come in and say, no, we're not running that. You're That's not you. You're not this guy. You're this guy over here. We're going to get you best. And good morning, Michael Ranchio. Appreciate you coming in and uh, the support you always show. The show. Did you see <clears throat> Did you see the movie Bohemian Rhapsody? Mm-hmm. Um, I actually, I didn't think it was that great a movie, honestly. Um, but one of the things that I really loved about it, and I've worked for people like this, is like, you know, when when Freddie Mercury goes out and does a solo thing, he goes, it was crap. You know why? Because I was surrounded by yes men. I didn't have anybody to tell me no. I didn't have anybody to bounce back and do this. What do you think players are? The players need that direction. That's why they aren't coaches. They're players. Mm-hmm. And I don't know to blame Hackett, Peyton, or whatnot. Hackett whether his legs were cut out from under him before he even got started, I don't know, but that dynamic's not going to work. You know, yeah. players, I, I think they're like training dogs and kids for God's sakes are going to get away with what you let them get away with. And they need direction. That's why you have coaches. That ain't going to fly this year, man. It, it, yeah. It's just not, you know, who's in charge coming in because the guys that own the team hired this man and they are going to empower him. Yeah. Hundred percent, and you could talk about Hackett's legs being cut up before he even came in. Maybe, potentially, we don't know for sure. But that relationship—I mean, it would be no wonder if that was the case that Azure Evero would maybe not be as interested in keeping around Denver because sure. he might not view it as a Nathaniel Hackett's fault for what happened last season, right. uh, given the circumstances in the locker room of this team that was highly dysfunctional. But uh, let's say hello to some people in here. Rock Chalk Broncos coming in uh, with the five dollars super saying good morning. Good morning to you. Hope you're doing well. Uh, if you had to guess, and I, guys, I'm going to keep doing this. You don't say it in your comments, but I'm going to add first names because the audio format, we have too many patents uh, these days. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm going to make sure that I add the first name. Uh, if And if you guys want to add the first name too, it adds, it makes it clearer. But I believe this is probably, probably the correct spelling. So if you had to guess, when will Sean Payton be officially introduced as the head coach? Sean, uh, I'm a bit surprised the contract hasn't been agreed to yet. I wouldn't be surprised if we hear it about it in the next 48 hours. This trade doesn't happen without the deal pretty much being agreed to in principle. They're just probably working out a few kinks here or there. But uh, the details of the contract reportedly, according to Mike Kliss, who's as insider on the Broncos as you're going to find, has stated that it's going to be about a 17 to $20 million per year contract. 
and the overall figures would be about 85 million over five years. Now teams don't typically have to announce what coaches are getting paid. There's been some sentiment uh, sentiment recently that like what coaches have reportedly been paid is oftentimes far less than what they actually get. There's other parts of their contract that are not reported. So it could be, I mean, when, what was it? What was the contract? The uh, Colin card was talking about 20 to 25 million per year. Now we're hearing 17 to 20. Probably it could be in between there. I mean, it really could yeah. depend on what's reported. And at the end, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't affect anything else. No. Um, except for it's just a matter of time. And if we didn't do a zillion of these, I could roll it back. I should have like marked it down. Okay, here's a Scott prediction. You're going to have an article where other owners are complaining that they are resetting the market and it is bad for football when this contract eventually comes out. Just just wait for it. That you're ruining football. They are resetting the market and it's it's unrealistic. Too bad. You let me know the next time one of these billionaires goes broke. All right. And and then I'll then I'll get out the violins for them. Cause you know, people talk about the players. Uh, now I won't go off on this for too long, but <laughs> the players are making too much money, blah, blah, blah. There's too much money in the game, period. That's our fault. Yeah, that's not theirs. I just soon go to the players and the coaches. That's that's who I'm watching. I don't particularly care about the owners. Their asset is increasing anyway. Their 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 value in the team increases every single year. It's the safest closed door billionaire boys club you could possibly invest in yeah yeah 100 so rock chalk thank you for coming in five dollar super we appreciate the heck out of you falling sloth saying good morning trying to get hype for sean payton but just keep getting flashback of last season's optimism uh hopefully peters to this finally being our guy man i hope it works you and me both falling sloth hope you're doing well cautiously optimistic good morning from bradley conger on a scale how much what's the scale <laughs> on how much you uh ha- has a, your outlook on next season improved It'll be inter- interesting to see the offseason moves. I think that the Broncos, the fact that they got a good coach and gave up picks and what I don't believe is a very good draft class uh, overall. I mean, this, you're still going to be missing out on talent with those picks being gone. No doubt about it. Those would have been nice chips to have improving the roster, especially long term, because uh, those cost control guys over four to five years are big. But uh, how does this improve the roster for me? I think four, four and a half wins. We talked about it a little bit last night because uh, it's not only bringing in Peyton against league average, but you're improving upon Nathaniel Hackett, who probably cost you two and a half games ish last season. Now you're bringing in Peyton three and a half, three, three and a half added wins on that. I think that's a a big swing uh, and that should improve a lot on top of just many things. It's not just the game calling too. It's the, the infrastructure in the practices and how they're setting up things and just the dynamic in the locker room, I think will be big. Well, and you saw how much everybody appreciated the fact that they were seeing good competitive football again in the last two games. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the, the expectations were so low because we we saw we I mentioned clown show this week a few times when talking. I said I'm not gonna I'm not gonna call it a clown show until I see the little car pull up at the press conference. Well, we saw the clown show. It was it was on the field every week, and it was just so disorganized, and there just seemed to be no direction that there was just never any feeling that it was going to get better. And when you lose hope, that's what we're talking about here. When you lose hope. You've, you've you're you're lost the, the season the season's lost yeah. like man i don't want to watch. i'm gonna go break my yard I'm gonna shovel snow blow leaves go fishing do something and um twenty thousand no shows was it that day um that I, I don't remember which one it was but you know i said that, that was the big story the big story of this game the big takeaway was twenty thousand no shows y'all spoke volumes you did and change has been implemented in a big way and hopefully it'll it'll turn around for you We'll see. Um, we got Kevin Gray. Good morning to you, Kevin. Hope you're doing well. We got our guy Riptide coming in saying, how many years is all I want to know in case he fails? Wouldn't want to be handcuffed to it if it doesn't work out. Nothing is for sure. This is another thing where it's not that it doesn't affect the salary cap at all. It's the owners burning money. Obviously, the NFL put out a memo this season at some point where they're like, hey, we're paying this many coaches to not coach. Maybe we should work on that. But there's no penalty for doing that. If the owners want to foot the bill on not that, yet. then it's going to... Not yet, <laughs> but uh, mm-hmm. if the owners want to, uh, if the league wants to change that, then they will. But right now, the owners are, if they're okay footing that bill, then is what it is. The deal, the years on the contract, I think, is more about security to the coach and their position mm-hmm. than anything else. And Scott, I want to take, I want to get your temperature on this. Um, I was you know, doing a little bit of research yesterday, digging through the contracts, and something peculiar stood out to me, which makes me think that one person has been telling the truth uh, from what they've been hearing. Another person is doing a little bit of PR work. D'Amico Ryan's first time head coach, only been coaching for four years in the league, gets a six year contract the first time he's a coach for the Houston Texans. 
typically head coaches, especially first time only get four years. Uh, and to me, that makes it seem like D'Amico Ryan's had a little bit of leverage from another team trying to move in on him saying, Hey, if you really want me kick up that year, give me a little bit more uh, guarantees on the back end. So uh, that's just another tally towards the, I think Ian Rappaport and saying that the Broncos were after Harbaugh and D'Amico Ryan's equally to Sean Payton is at, I think it's more likely than Adam Schefter saying they never were in contact uh, with D'Amico Ryan's or his agent. That's very specific language. Also, um, you can still be talking to D'Amico Ryan's without directly talking to D'Amico Ryan's and his agent through all these back channels. You see it all the time in pre-free agency. Uh, so I'm curious your thoughts on that. All right. Say it with me now, everybody. The Broncos are going to be linked with head coaches because they've got the deepest pockets. And if I am negotiating with the Houston Texans, I want them to know I could go to the Denver Broncos. Yeah. If I am the Denver Broncos and I'm negotiating with the New Orleans Saints, I want them to know I could walk away from Sean Payton at any given time. Mm -hmm. All of this was a negotiation. All of it. On a, on and you will you won't convince me that Sean Payton wasn't if not at the very top, when we said 1A, 1B, if it was Harbaugh, fine. You will not convince me that Sean Payton wasn't, at worst, the second choice between Harbaugh. At worst, ever. Yeah. You'll, you'll never convince me that. And again, we can grab onto. There's enough misinformation out there. I told you, this is a poker game. Yeah. There's enough misinformation out there that I can pick a side and find a very credible source on mm -hmm. Twitter and link. Ian Rappaport says this. Mike Kliss says this. Adam Schefter says this. You know what Scott says? Wait and see what happens because you can't believe any of them. They're all out for themselves, and they're all playing a game. They're all mm -hmm. playing a high-stakes poker game, and they're all bluffing, negotiating, lying. What finally happens? You got Sean Payton at a pretty good price. You played the game really, really well. Yep. And – Again, the results are the results. That's the only thing that we know for sure uh, with how much misinformation and ex extraneous information is out there. Based on what I've seen and how I connect the dots, I do think that the Broncos were would have been fine. They really liked Miko Ryans. They also really liked Jim Harbaugh. And they also like Sean Payton. They got one of their top three. Maybe it'll end up being the best one. Maybe it'll be, end up being a mistake. Uh, but the results are the results. And uh, that's what we can go off of going forward. Uh, we got our guy Alberto coming in saying good morning. Uh, good to be back and actually excited for something. Good to have you excited, Alberto. Although we've been here constantly almost every morning. You should be excited for us joining you in the morning. What's going on? We're not doing it for you anymore. <laughs> Bama X coming in saying good morning. We appreciate you, Bama X. Hope you're doing well. And we also got Toyin Williams coming in with the 449 pounds saying great news on the addition of Sean Payton. Interested to see his supporting cast. What are the chances Vic is a part of it? I know that Adam... Showing, he's a beat reporter for Miami Herald, I believe. I'm gonna miss. I definitely messed up his name. He's a pretty know, it was a Joe, Shane Joe Shad or something. J Joe Shad, I think it's Joe Shad is the name. Um, yeah, Joe time. Shad said it, and um, I thought I saw Adam Shine or someone else said it as well. Uh, mm -hmm. That it's he's still expected to end up in Miami. Expect until the deal is signed, though. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what happens. And expected. you mentioned it earlier. You're, yeah, expected. Um, I'm expecting to have it. a great day. You know how that changes. <sighs> God bless. Uh, or expecting to have a poopy day and it gets better. You know, that's that's what, let's have it the other way. Let's spin it. Uh, kindness and positivity, <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, I think that the Broncos are at least interested in Vic Fangio. I don't give a flying you know what about the dynamic in the locker room. It's a coaches with player dynamic, not a buddy buddy dynamic. Uh, so if somebody has an issue with it, that's too damn bad. <laughs> Unless there's something behind the scenes that I don't know about in regards to Vic Fangio. Like if he was torturing them or something, then that's, that's totally different uh, dynamic out there. But uh, I digress. Um, as far as uh, Vic Fangio, I'd be fine if he was part of it. And I think you made a point earlier about the coach or the owners coming together and complaining, you know, crying about uh, Broncos paying too much for coaches. I think for the Sean Payton side of things, it won't come out just yet. But when it gets into the coordinators and assistant coaches getting paid, tears more than what they have in the past. That's when I think there's going to be some foul play and crying at, coming out. At what point do we start seeing, because we know this is a socialist model that they have. This is a, the NFL is the big company and then it's got its, they own the franchises. Mm -hmm. We call these, these guys, the owners, but they own franchises of the NFL and they dictate for the most part, who's going where, at what point do they put a coach's salary cap on this thing? Is that what the Broncos will do with football? That they put a coach's salary cap on it because they have to put a salary cap on it because 
they can't control themselves. They can't control the spending. That's why they have it. It's like, well, well, we can't compete with those guys, so you can't let them spend anymore. Well, tough. You can on coaches and facilities and all those type of things. So is that what comes out of this, Nick? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think, think so. it'll come yeah. to that. But, uh, yeah, get ready to hear some negative. This will be the most expensive coaching staff ever assembled in American sports. And get ready for some backlash about it. And you know what you can say to that? I don't care. Tough. Hey, too bad for you. Step up. Man. You can't compete. Relegate yourselves. Go play. Go play somewhere else. Go go join the USFL. I know it would be the most. Like it should though. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you on that one. Whoever's the head, be the, 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 the most expensive paid head coach right now is probably the most expensive coach because the coach, the head coach, makes so much more than everybody else. That by Sean yeah. Payton, if he's getting twenty, there's probably not a, a twenty million staff out there uh, along. But the headline most expensive coaching staff ever assembled will will sell better. And that's what's going to, that's what we're going to see. I would be wondering if this is, I have no idea what the numbers would look like here, but given the vastness of what college staffs are these days, maybe a staff like Georgia might pay more overall, considering the staff is like six times as big as an NFL staff and Kirby's getting paid 14 million or something. Yeah, he was, he was maybe with, with all that. And like I said, cause there's, you can keep too. adding assistance, this assistance that you can't have any, you know, on the field, but you can add uh, consultants and that type mm -hmm. of stuff and recruiting staff. So yeah, the staff might be out there. And as I've always said, it's changing a little bit. Hopefully, you know, I was at a camp one time with uh, an elite camp up in, up in Oregon, the Nike, the opening. And one of the top players, his dad was like, Oh man, this place was great. The facilities were awesome. They had this, they had this, they had this. And I kind of looked at him and I said, yeah, you can afford all that stuff when you don't have to pay your employees. Kind of gave me a look and he, he came back to me about 30 minutes later. He's like, you know, you're right. I never thought of it that way. I'm like, they don't want you to think about it that way. They, they want you to, to confuse you into thinking, Hey, we've got all this labor out here. That is our product and we don't have to pay them. It's great. Um, so yes, I pour all the money into, Hey, look, squirrel, uh, which yeah. includes facilities and extras and, and coaching staffs. I so don't want to write my, might might be someone like Georgia. Uh, I don't want to disparage Oregon too much here. Cause I think they're a fun brand and whatnot, but I do have it on pretty good authority. They've, uh, been reaching out to players under scholarship, trying to get them to enter the portal and, uh, come to Oregon with uh, big money on that Phil, Phil Knight, uh, NIL deal, which is. Multi-year contract, Ch Nick, I'm Cheney. telling you. Let's fix it. Yeah, yeah, yep. <sighs> okay, uh, Jeremy, Sean, morning, boys. Seems like some... Side jar. Yeah, <laughs> side jar. Oh, God, I'm still bummed about Oregon taking that. But good to see you, Jeremy. Sorry, Scott, click clicked it off there because we got Grover coming in, 999, saying morning, gents. With Peyton coming on over, over under on how many primetime games we get or a network still cringing over this last season. I mean, how many talking points were from the Broncos struggling this season? They're still going to get eyeballs on there. People are going to want to... Put it in uh, to watch it. I'm guessing we're going to get uh, four primetime games this season scheduled off the bat. That sounds about right. And a big draw is a big draw. The Cowboys, mm -hmm. whether they're winning or not, are going to be on primetime. They're going to get the, the the best time slots every time. Denver Broncos are an upper echelon team, and they'll have some new storylines. Hopefully, it doesn't really matter. That's not the reason you're winning or losing games. Um but maybe it'd be better to be playing them, especially flexed later in the season instead of all mm -hmm. of the uh, yeah. all front loaded this time. Uh, so Grover, appreciate you coming in. Yella, Yella, yeah. my friend. Um, oh, there was a lot of cringing going on. We, uh, if you didn't hear me say, Nick and I have a uh, have a just a running joke every time we go. <sighs> well, there's a side jar. You get, we don't have a swear jar. You got to put a dollar in the side jar. That's what it was like trying to explain the Broncos' offense this year. We we had to institute that. Andre reacting to what I was saying. He says, backlash. I'm going to cry in a corner and wipe my tears with money. Feels good to be rich and obnoxious. They're rich. I don't think they're obnoxious. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to be obnoxious yet. about it. I don't want to be new money. I want to be old money. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm wealthy. I don't have to show it. I know it. Kind of like when I rode around, I had a, I had a uh, Triumph Speed Triple. That thing would whip just about anything on the road just about it there's like one or two motorcycles that you'd see that could could beat that thing i never drove it fast i didn't have to i had it the brain had to show it off oh i miss my speedy <laughs> 
Ah, uh, Scott, I just I never got into the gearhead stuff. So uh, oh, that's... my grandfather had my dad had one. I'd started riding motorcycles when I was about ten years old. Hmm. I moved into this uppity neighborhood that's closed gate and doesn't allow motorcycles. I'm like, are you joking me? Come on! You got but some high speed golf carts though. Yeah. Meanwhile, everybody there has uh, you know four lawn services, so they they're sending me food stamps because I cut my own grass. <laughs> uh, sounds like a motocross track in my neighborhood, but no motorcycles. My like, good lord, people. Anyway. Let's move on. Man, we got from don't have to show the money to we got old money complaints. We got sunny days coming in. Good morning, Dia Sunny. We appreciate you. BK, our Denver Luke coming in saying good morning, Nick and Scott. Jetty Splash, always good to see you, Jetty. Hope you're doing well and uh, hope things are going great for you. Out there, Jason O'Neill. Good morning to you, Jason. Craig Smith, top of the morning. We also got all the happy birthdays to Steve coming in. See, you guys are awesome. I'm already trying to catch up to some of this. Juan Espinoza. Coming in saying, good morning, gentlemen. When do you expect Sean to sign his contract? Oh, did we get to this one already? Juan, thank you. Uh, we'll see what happens with uh, Jeremy Sean or with uh, <laughs> Sean Payton. I think that uh, Jer- I saw Jeremy on there as well. Um, I'm guessing Monday will be the press conference. I, before I had said Friday, but now that we haven't heard anything, got the weekend to work it over. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. Bobby Vincent saying, Kennedy is at a hotel. It is. I'm at the old Homewood Suites in Mobile, Alabama, and it's it's great. I like having this extra space in here. Last year I did it, and it was all a single room, and I didn't have any room. This way I've got some light behind me and, and plenty of space. So shout out to the Homewood Suites. Good good price. Great breakfast, too. Goodness. Eating my weight in breakfast, and I starved myself all day. So uh, been, a, been a good stay here. The internet kind of crapped out on me a little bit last night, but overall been – had a really good time down here, Bobby. Appreciate appreciate you asking. And we got Aki. Oh, we got Kevin first coming in four ninety nine. Kevin seven saying with uh, Peyton as our head coach, what free agents or player are most likely to make their way on on over here? Offensive line needs shaping reshaping badly. Hope Munchak comes back. There's another offensive line slash run game coordinator that uh, the Saints had for a number of years that I believe he was let go. Uh, he's one that there's been some connection there. His name starts with a D. I didn't uh, know it as well, but he's one that. Uh, I keep an eye on if it's not Munchak as far as players that could come with. There's a number of players on the Saints defensive side of the ball that could become available. I'm really curious to see what happens with potential trades on the offensive side. There's some offensive linemen, maybe even an Alvin Kamara uh, that could be available for a day three pick kind of thing. Sorry, I mean, Kamara has been great, but he hasn't been as great recently. And with his contract and age, that's just the reality of the running back position. So uh, definitely some guys come over, but I don't think they have many free agent offensive guys uh, out there all right let me throw some names at you i'm looking at spot rack bradley roby's 31 years old I doubt uh, they could you use some veteran at, at, a, at a decent price i don't think he'll probably come in that that expensive i don't think so uh he's okay. he was the broncos uh first round draft pick in 2017 he was okay. on the super bowl did, team so 2015 know that yeah. he's already 31 years old goodness yep. Time flies. Yep. Uh, defensive tackle david on is coming off of a nine million dollar contract he's 30. He's possible because um, you don't know what's doing to the defense and Draymond Jones. Jarvis Landry is pretty dependable. 30 years old. He's coming off of just 3 million uh, average salary. We mentioned Marcus Davenport before at edge. He's 26 and as a, as a good player, former first round pick. This one could be interesting as your veteran backup and Andy Dalton uh, mm-hmm. running back. Mark Ingram's 33. Not sure you want to go there. Um, PJ Williams at corner. Uh, and then some guys, and they've got some lower level free agents um, on down the road. But there's a there's a couple guys, and then maybe one safety to watch out for is a Kareem Jackson replacement, is former Saint, maybe Von Bell, um, mm-hmm. played with the Bengals recently. Someone to to keep an eye on. The two um, Saints that you mentioned there on offense didn't play with Sean Payton. Andy Dalton signed a one year deal, never played with Sean Payton, and Jarvis right. Landry signed a one year deal, never played with Sean Payton. So, but it's mostly on the defense. New Orleans, side. the culture. I'm sure he was still around either way. And those guys yeah. are free agent from the Saints. Yep. Um. Who was I? Oh, in, in defensive guys, you are going to be in competition with the Atlanta Falcons on those guys. And the no Falcons way. have about three times the money. Um, so if you're going after those guys, that you're you're the Falcons need everything on defense. Everything. Um, because it, it, you usually have, you know, if you've got a good corner, well, there's two corners. If you've got a good defensive end, there's another defensive end. The Falcons need everything except maybe an inside linebacker. And even yeah. that's questionable. So you're going to be in competition with them because they just hired uh, Ryan Nielsen as their defensive coordinator. And he was the deep, a well-liked defensive uh, line coach for New Orleans. So mm-hmm. you're going to be in competition with those guys on the defensive side of the ball. 
Yep. Uh, we got Aki Dragon saying, Nick, are you familiar with Iowa's Jack Campbell? Josie Jewell-esque or more potential? He has way more potential than Josie Jewell just because he's significantly bigger. Uh, Josie Jewell, God bless him, he's a smart player, good, pretty much always in position. He's an underrated athlete. Uh, my biggest complaint with Josie Jewell is that he doesn't have a lot of length. He's a, he's in a small package uh, as well. And uh, <laughs> Jack Campbell, he's got a big package, uh, length for days. Uh, he's, six, he's like 6'5", 250 with uh, crazy arm length. And uh, I think that with teams playing more, two high safety shells with teams playing lighter boxes, you want more length and size You're killing me, and dude. You're killing mass me. Uh, to fill, you know, those whole, the more space up front. So uh, I think Jack Campbell is probably going to end up being a late second round pick. Maybe uh, mid second round to mid third is my prediction for him. Uh, also, I cannot tell you enough. This is just me being, you know, connections to the Iowa team. The coaches and the players absolutely love the guy. Like as far as a work ethic, he's just constant. He's not like an emotional, crazy person, but nobody works harder. He's a coach on the field type. Um, Butkus award winner. I mean, you taught you Kirk Ferentz talks about him. And he starts like to cry at the podium with how much they adore that guy. So uh, Kirk Ferentz, Iowa head coach. So he's, I, I want to see what he tests like uh, because I don't think he's an elite athlete, but with his size and length and with how good he is in uh, the run game, I think he's going to be a very good player for whoever drafts him in the middle of day two. All right. Sorry, Scott. Drake <laughs> Wally coming in. Uh, Drake, good morning, my friend. How are you? Uh, do some work with Drake. Drake's a good dude. Uh, says, good morning, fellas. Out of the offense position groups, excluding quarterback, which benefits most from Peyton at the helm? Yeah. Go ahead, Nick. I already have an answer, and I don't want to spoil it. I've got to be, God, man, outside of the offensive positions. Out of the offensive positions. Probably wide receivers uh, would be my assumption here because he does such a good job with matching up uh, of, for those guys. He's very much a, a I'm going to find a specific area where I feel like the offense has an advantage and he will spam that. Uh, he'll kind of feel out things early. And then once he sees how you're playing defense, what your answers are uh, to those kind of questions, um, he will go to that well repeatedly. So uh, I think it's really going to be the wide receivers. Really, I mean, when I say wide receivers, it could be a pass catching back. It could be a pass catching tight end, but Isolating those matchups in space is what Sean Payton does great. And I think <clears throat> I'm going to take a holistic view of this thing, if I'm mm. using that phrase right. I'm going to go with the offensive line. Mm. You know, the the way that you can scheme, all the things that Nick just said are true, all the things that you can scheme open. If I can have the defense second-guessing at all based on, am I going to run this play? Am I going to go misdirection here? Am I got motion here? Follow this. If I've got them on their heels even just a smidge – the offensive line is going to benefit greatly because we're not, I, I use the word predictive. I don't even know if that's the right word, a word or not. It is now. If you're not predictable on offense and I can dictate to you instead of vice versa, when the defense is dictating to me, I'm in trouble. The offensive line is going to benefit greatly through better play calling, better matchups, all those type of things in order just to keep the defense guessing even just a little bit. When the defense doesn't have to guess, you got no chance. They know what you're doing. You're in big, big trouble. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the offensive line could should be the most improved unit. Um, uh, I do want to add to your comment on that one. It's not just for me and Sean Payton on that one. It is with Sean Payton at the helm, but it's downstream. It's Sean Payton bringing in a much better else. offensive line coach in potentially Mike Munchak or uh, Dan Rouster. That's the name that I would keep an eye on. He's been the run game coordinator, tight ends coach, and offensive line coach for the Saints since 2016. And that Saints team has been a continual top five offensive line uh, over the past half decade. Uh, they, I mean, uh, Tr Teron Armstead, Cesar Ruiz, uh, Ryan Ramchek, there's uh, Andreas Pete. I mean, that Saints offensive line has been damn good. Scott, you'd know. I mean, I hate to praise so much. Oh, both, uh, both side of the trenches yeah, um, have been yep. good. You know, you Cam Jordan. I anytime I write his name, I call him Falcon Tormentor. I mean, he's I love Cam. He's the the defenses have been great, and I you've heard me wax poetic about the linebackers the Saints used to have. I don't. I'm I'm not one of those rivalry type guys. Not not with really any team except maybe Arsenal. And my best friends an Arsenal fan. So you you grow up an Atlanta sports fan that was born in Cleveland. You can't talk a whole lot of trash. You kind of have to really appreciate the whole game, which is one of the reasons why I'm here that I do what I do here is because I appreciate the game. Mm -hmm. um, I don't hate the players or the game. 
Yep. And Kathy, we love you coming in with the five euros. Yettos says, you guys think getting a hard knocks or some sort of hype show? I don't know if they even available because of the new coach, MHH for life. I've watched maybe 10 seconds of hard knocks. Um, I, I turned it on just to, I don't know, maybe it was already on. I was watching HBO True Blood or something. That's how long ago it was. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, they walk a guy in and they cut him. I'm like, I felt like I just watched the end of Old Yeller. I'm like, I, I don't want I don't want to watch this. So I'm actually I don't know anything about hard knocks, to be honest with you. And frankly, I haven't I watched in the sporting world. I don't. That's not my entertainment. <laughs> yeah, I haven't watched it very much. If the Broncos were on it, I would watch it because there'd be storylines there and in, inside information that they'd let us see. But still uh, some info. I don't think the Broncos qualify for hard knocks again, given the first time I had coaching staff, but I, there's also the one that's on Amazon that I cannot recall what the, uh, the name of that show is that the Broncos, I think could qualify, qualify for even the first time head coach, man, it would be a, a, a sight to behold. You bet the NFL would love to have the cameras in there for that with uh, the Sean Payton and uh, Russell Wilson dynamic, just because, I mean, you get Sierra interviewing in there as well. I mean, it'd be very interesting to follow. Rip tie coming in, although you wouldn't get very much from Pat from Patrick Sertan, which is great. He's the opposite of uh, most cornerbacks out there. The quietest, quiet assassin. Brandon Cook, sixty five percent catch rate. Trade a wide receiver from Rip tie. It's certainly possible. Uh, I know that uh, on Instagram, um, everybody. It's crazy how good these people are at uh, finding these little things like this. But Brandon Cooks liked the Broncos announcement of uh, getting Sean Payton here. He was really good with the Saints for a number of years underneath Sean Payton. He's really unhappy in Houston. He wants out. If the Broncos do end up trading Cortland Sutton, let's say, for example, probably the one that would make the most sense uh, in, in this offseason if you do trade one. Maybe you do bring in Brandon Cooks uh, for a trade where you're maybe even paying less to bring in Cooks than you would get back from Sutton given the age and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, Brandon Cooks has been a good player at Oregon State for a number of years. I think he had – he's one of the only players in NFL history to have a 1,000-yard season with three different teams, I believe is the stat there for him. So, uh been a good player for a long time, and I feel bad for him in Houston. I, I got to see him in high school. He was uh, mm-hmm. a little undersized. And I remember writing in his bio at the time, has, and I quote, run away from you speed, end quote. And I don't think we ranked him all that high, honestly. I mean, he was he was ranked, mm-hmm. but I think there were some size concerns. You know, we we're a little bit worried about, you know, is he kind of a, just a, a, a track, a, a smallish track guy? Man, mm-hmm. no, he was, he's been really really good um i would consider that uh one of my misses so i really like seeing brandon cooks could he come in and this comes back on um let me see it was eric Corden. eric figueroa has a question in there he says do we trade a wide receiver for draft picks just back to back on 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 these two and thank you for the super um support in the show like that yes yeah. dark doesn't keep my forehead quite as shiny but i'll have it good and shined up when we get back and at, at home with the with the big lights on me yeah, Do next we trade Monday, a wide receiver we'll... for draft picks. Is there a receiver you don't want? Is is KJ done? You know, otherwise, you ran out of wide receivers this year. You, yeah. I don't think you can afford to, to to be trading them unless one of the reasons you ran out was because KJ can't stay on the field, and maybe you can get something out of him no. for him in return. Because frankly, you haven't gotten anything in return on your draft pick from KJ Hamler. You know, not entirely his own fault, but it's been it's been a, a poor pick, uh, poor return on that draft pick. Yeah, you might be able to get like a seventh round pick or a sixth round pick for KJ Hamler because he's still exceedingly young, and that speed does matter. I mean, you, you saw what Christian Kirk got last season, and he had some injuries in Arizona as well. Much more productive than KJ Hamler. Don't get don't get it twisted, but um, speed matters in today's NFL. Uh, so you could see maybe KJ Hamler getting traded. I can't imagine. Trading Jerry Judy, I saw there was a Dallas fan on Twitter said that, oh, the Dallas should call to call the Broncos to see if they can get Jerry Judy because the Broncos need draft picks. If Bron- Everybody's for sale. First off, I'm very much of the opinion that everybody's for sale at the right pi- price. Mm-hmm. If you're trading for Jerry Judy, I want a one and a two this year and a two next year, um, especially because he's the only guy on this roster right now that I trust to win a uh, man coverage matchup. If you're playing man against him, we're spamming the Jerry Judy button, and I think Sean Payton – uh, all the Broncos moves that they've made have said, we're not in a rebuild right now. We're in a go for it and try to maximize and uh, fix Russell Wilson. That's not trading Jerry Judy unless you massively overpay. Uh, so wide receiver draft picks, KJ Hamler, maybe we'll see what happens with him. And then Cortland Sutton, 
Maybe. I, I think you're more likely to keep those guys. Maybe with Cortland Sutton, they try to approach him with a restructure and he says no, and then he's on the move. There's been some rumblings of uh, that situation with some of the players on the Broncos, but uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, and, and Ethan says, and Tim Patrick's a little bit in the same boat, he says we have to stop talking about trading Sutton as his dead cap is $25 million this year, whereas his cap hit, if he remains, is 18. You'd have to restructure again to make a trade happen. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Ethan, I know you've heard me say, you're in here enough, heard me say a lot about the contracts that would be much more manageable after 2023. You know, if it doesn't work, if Russ is cooked, let Russ cook, hell, Russ is cooked. If he's done, if it's not going to work, the roster is set up where you can hit the reset button after 2023, including Russell Wilson, where you can you you can basically get out from under his, where he, his contract where you can restart in 2024. No, you wouldn't have all that money back, but if you're resetting, you're not going for the Super Bowl in 2024 anyway. You're rebuilding. Sutton and Patrick both have similar contracts, not nearly as much money, but where they become move onable from in 2024, whereas right now the dead cap hit, like you said, Patrick's in the same boat. And and for me, I said it before, talking about trading Sutton or you know Judy or Patrick, those are your three guys for me right now. Uh, you ran out of receivers last year. You need you need those three guys. You need Tim Patrick to be back. You need them to be complimentary because they're they're different types of guys. You need all three of them. You want all three of them next year. Yeah, and I'm not sure. For coming yeah. in again. Appreciate you, Ethan. I am not sure. I should find this out. I think you can trade somebody and or release somebody and designate them with a post June 1st designation mm -hmm. while it actually happens before post June 1st. I think it's more of a terminology thing um, rather than when it you actually agree to happens. terms and then you execute it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Broncos, if they did want to move on from sudden, the post June 1st trade designation nets them 14 million in cap savings this year with a dead cap hit of 3.8 million this year and 7.6 in 2024. That's one avenue that it, it would be feasible. I think it's one of those things, though. Like Ethan said, the dead cap hit uh, means that a team's going to have to overpay. Is somebody going to want to pay, overpay Cortland Sutton right now? You probably have the wide receivers that you have. Broncos, maybe you'll draft somebody or bring in, you know, a wide receiver four type or somebody who uh, can push Montreal Washington in the uh, returner slash gadget role. But uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. There's, it's going to be interesting to see how this Broncos team turns over. I think there's going to be some unexpected moves. Montreal Washington might not be on the team next year. That's what I'm saying. Uh, you know, he he might he might not be on the team next year. He's got to really work on everything about his game in order just to make the team. Mm -hmm. People that drafted him are gone. Um, yeah. At least that push for him the most. You know, again, I say I don't want to contradict myself too much in saying that every player that's drafted is George Payton's draft. But when you draft to a system, so to speak, and you draft specific guys for a specific role – roles change mm -hmm. i need guys that can fit any role and, and and again to be fair what was he fifth round fifth round sixth round you're you're fifth. looking at trades at that point yeah so, oh yeah montreal fifth round yeah super you know very quick and could be a good return guy but you can get a return specialist a little bit later than fifth nick he had a good Ride game Avery against Williams. yeah he had a good game against Florida and that made people draft him. But like for being such a small school, I needed him to test like an absolute freak for being a niche player. And he didn't test like an absolute freak. Uh, so I don't know. I still don't. I had, I don't know if you were on the show when we were doing that, uh, the day three long running draft uh, show where it was like four or four and a half hours, but the uh, vacant expression and uh, look in my eyes when that pick came through was like, what? That's mm -hmm. like a, maybe a seventh round guy or something. I, that one was massively confusing. Yeah, seventh. I mean, that's why I said that's where the Falcons got Avery Williams, who ended up, I don't know if he went to the Pro Bowl this year or was going as a return man, but had a really good season. Mm -hmm. uh, led the league in, in punt returns. That's where you get your 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 specialists. You know, yeah. The fifth was a little high, but again, it is just a fifth rounder, but those fifth I would rounders argue... are starting to feel a little, uh, a little more valuable right now, aren't they? Yeah. And I would argue that just a fifth rounder is if you drafted like a safety or a cornerback or a wide receiver, Fine. You drafted Montreal Washington specifically with special teams right. in mind. That yes. would be a busted fifth round pick. I like there's very few the avenues. Fifth. Yeah. I can get like, a running back. I can get a good running back in the fifth. I can usually get a pretty good linebacker in the fifth, and I can find an interior lineman in the fifth. 
I mean, Isaiah Pacheco went in the seventh round, and he's oh. been awesome for the Chiefs. He was in my Denver Broncos mock draft uh, before the season in the seventh round to the Broncos. I digress. Uh, but yeah, that's fifth round picks aren't busts. They are if you drafted them specifically for special teams and they don't make yeah. it to. Yeah, if I drafted a kicker year in the fifth and he couldn't, and I cut him. That's a bust. Yep. Quentin I Caldwell, agree. not a bust here. $10 saying, Good morning, everyone. Glad we have Sean Payton. Time to get the rest of the coaching staff together. You called it, Scott. Yep, time to. I'm really excited to see who they bring in. Uh, it's going to be a relationships thing. Uh, see who I know. Chris Richard, uh, the defensive backs coach and the co defensive coordinator for the Saints, was let go. He's a possibility. Vic Fangio is still out there, could still have his Euro Evero. I'm not sure if there's a relationship between Steve Wilkes and um, Sean Payton. I know that the Broncos are looking to bring in a almost like a defensive side of the ball head coach figurehead out there so Sean can be more offense slash CEO. So uh, we'll see. The Broncos are going to be able to pay somebody good money. Also, this this is still a pretty good defensive roster on that side of the ball. Uh, so the fact that you have a true elite building block piece and Patrick Sertain on that side makes the defensive coordinator's job exponentially easier um, next season. So uh, we'll see what happens with the defensive side of the ball. Col- Connor Klein coming in. Saying, Quentin. Yeah, God bless you, Quentin, coming in with the uh, the best mop in the game on the uh, mile high uh uh, Broncos for breakfast guys. We got Connor Klein saying, do you see some major improvement in the training staff because of injuries? Also, what do you guys think about Irv Smith jr? I would imagine that you see improvements on the injury front just out of the reset that you have. I mean, it should reset back to about zero every single year. And then you have a better chance of uh, not having injuries, but we've said that the last few seasons, the Broncos continue to be near the league lead in injuries. So, Broncos ownership, they sounds like they've been digging into it. We'll see what Sean Payton's opinion is on this, who they want to bring in. Would imagine it's better. As far as Irv Smith Jr., um, small, not very athletic tight end. Third round pick, I believe, from Alabama, went to the Vikings. Vikings didn't really love him that much. He was pretty much displaced off that roster after uh, they traded for Hawkinson this season. If he wants to come in for a near vet minimum, like a two-year kind of deal to be an H-back slash uh, tight end type, then okay, but uh, he's somebody that's, you know, late second wave, third wave of free agency type in my book. I think you, when you start hearing local media, the guys that are there every single day, starting asking the tougher questions, it's a hint that they're being told it's time to ask the tougher questions because we're going to make a move there Mm -hmm. because they don't want to, they don't want to burn any bridges. They got to keep their relationships. So when you see them turn on a coach, that coach is done. Uh, They, you just, you know, it's already done. We started seeing that, Connor, at the end of the year with the training staff, with the injuries becoming more of a question in press conferences, being more addressed by the coaches while they were standing up there. Um, then Now, Nathaniel Hackett, to be fair, again, I try and think of every single avenue. I'm convinced he was fired in October. Um, he was done at the end of the year. He didn't start talking about all the injuries until after that. And you know what? I don't have to cover for this guy anymore. I can start talking about we've got more hamstring injuries than anybody else in the league. I can start laying the groundwork for my interviews that I'm going to be having after the season when I'm gone. Um, So maybe, you know, that's where we started hearing from Nathaniel Hackett talking about the training. We look at everything. We will look at everything. But we also heard Greg Penner talk about it when they actually finally moved on from Nathaniel Hackett. Yes, we will address this. We will go after it. We know they have done some research into it already. Connor, I expect changes. I expect changes. It just wasn't going to happen. And I expect them before OTAs um, for the guys to come in. They'll, they'll, they'll be working out on their own from now until they report for OTAs. And that's when you need to have stuff in place. Yep. 100%. It's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. I mean, the whole infrastructure of this team, the roster, the coaching staff, the strength conditioning, the front office. Maybe there'll be some changes there. I mean, it's a lot of change in Denver, a lot of change. Hopefully after this offseason, that we get some stability. But uh, we'll see. A lot of that's going to depend on the play of Russell Wilson. So uh, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, Scott, got 10 minutes left here. want to ask you about the Senior Bowl. If, for those of you at home that don't realize it, Scott doesn't have his green screen behind him showing him in Denver because he's on site down there on the uh, the Gulf Shore uh, in Mobile, Alabama, covering the Senior Bowl. Scott's been down there capturing it all in 4K, uh, filming it, and then cutting up the tape and putting it on his YouTube channel. He can drop that in the chat if he wishes. If you guys are curious about the matchups, you know, you hear people talking about the Senior Bowl, well, go judge for yourself. Scott's got the uh, the tape uh, cut up, and you can watch a bunch of these guys out here. But, Scott, you've uh, been there for two days now. You've cut up a lot of film. You've watched some guys. 
and uh, you got to sleep on it a little bit too. What are your thoughts coming out of the senior bowl right now? Who is standing out for you? Um, I'll take one off the table for you because uh, we've heard about him a lot in Dewan Jones. Big, this, yeah, this is there. a, this is a good, I'll look down and it's like, if you ask me, it's like they're, they all kind of run together in my head and it's hard. It's like they're spinning and I have to pick a name. So if you ask me a name, that'll help me focus. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm that'll help me focus. Cause I have watched and they're up there. There's like 13 minutes of clips out there. I just put it, put my, uh, in the, in the stream. It's basically every one-on-one -on -one for day one. Day two, I watch skill guys. I haven't gone through that one nearly as much. Again, I'm at practice for five hours. We've done five pods, and it takes some time to cut these up. And it's it's been – this will be a month-long process, not just this week for sure. So um, we've got some – Scott, the Buffet Killer, the Buffet Killer Kennedy. Um, yeah, not too bad, not too bad. And I, I, I am a vegetarian, so I stay away. But those, those eggs and potatoes took a beating this morning. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, that's uh... – God bless me. You got to get your money's worth, right? If you're out yeah, there. Hit, hit me, hit me up some names. I'll, I'll, I'll start with one actually. Um, okay. A name that we kind of, it sticks in my head, but just because it's a, it's a nursery rhyme, you know, it's John Michael Schmitz. Good. Oh man. Okay. He's been really, really good. And he has been at center. You know, I think I mentioned yesterday, I'm like, I don't remember him for sure being a center. He's been at center. Okay. Um, I've watched him in the one-on-ones. I haven't watched team stuff because I only cut up the one-on-one so far. When I do the individual clips and cut up John Michael Schmitz's highlights from the week, I will do all the team, but I haven't done that yet. In the one-on-one -on -one stuff, there is there's almost a run one-on-one -on -one and then a pass one-on-one, -on -one, and he has been really, really good. And yeah. uh, Michael Ronquillo, again, coming in awesome. He says, I have a total of almost 10 thousand stars this week for the mile how podcast you rock michael um we love you for it again uh you're one of the reasons why we are here chris hernandez has come in he says good morning have a great day he came in earlier today sorry we missed that one uh michael and then we did get phil uh we did not get phil but he says good morning broncos for breakfast and happy birthday to a new nickname cardinal kennedy that's 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 papa groundhog so um Thanks to all of y'all for sure. But John Michael Schmitz has been really, really good, Nick. Yeah. Good to hear. Um, I, You know, I was a big fan of him. Uh, he was incredible versus Iowa. There's some questions about his pass protection um, coming out of Minnesota. But uh, he's one that I've debated on the Broncos with their now third-round picks, potentially uh, seeking out. I do agree with you, though, to a point where this Broncos team probably needs some stability and known quantity at the center position. Uh, so maybe you'd, I'd rather them draft a left guard or a right tackle than a center. Right. Uh, this season, I'd rather pay for a center if that's all possible, but we'll see how the market uh, plays out here. We got free agency first, and that'll kind of change how uh, the how all that looks. We got Kathy coming in. She is a gigantic Darnell Wright fan mm -hmm. out there at Tennessee. So let's ask about Darnell Wright. Uh, right tackle from Tennessee uh, came in. We kind of joked a little bit about his uh, hand size because of how weird it was comparison to his body size, you know, but... And that does matter a little bit for offensive linemen, given their uh, their ability to grip and uh, latch onto their blocks. But uh, I digress. Darnell, uh, Darnell Wright, uh, potential player for the Broncos, maybe round three. A lot of people said round one, but I'm thinking round two is where I would peg him. Maybe maybe round three. We'll see. I My initial impressions for him right now, are I, I like him better right now than I like Trey Smith at the same stage. And mm -hmm. Trey Smith has been really good. I, I think... He could play right tackle in a run heavy offense, um, but he, which to me means he's he's really a guard. Uh, he's so strong. He plays with such great leverage. Uh, his feet have looked good. He's really done well, Kathy. I've got several several Darnell Wright on there uh, on that that uh, on my channel. He's on the American team. American is basically SEC South. National is basically everybody else. So I think Aki, you asked yesterday, what, you know, I said, American, what are they playing the commies? I'm like, no, it, it's set up like major league baseball. One, one of the teams is the American league and the other one's the national league. And, um, Donald Wright has looked solid. Um, right tackle guard. I think depending on, we talk schemes, but depending on where you need him the most, he seems like a better fit long-term to me. And what did he end up measuring to it? Uh, Darnell Wright came in at six, five, three 42, 34 inch, uh, arms you know an 83 inch wingspan so he's got tackle measurements for the most part he plays with better leverage than that you might think with those long arms he's he's really he when he locks on he he's a people mover he, just, he strikes me as a really good guard yep i 
watching him, I see Tevin Jenkins, who you know I really liked out coming out of Oklahoma State. Some questions about the foot speed, uh, the redirection ability, and pass uh, pass protection, but just an ass kicker as a run blocker and really explosive in short areas, which is you want that arrived violence for that guard to get that dis, uh, displacement from those defensive tackles. So I think he could play at right tackle. I love him at guard uh, in comparison, but uh, that's true for a good number of guys. So I want to keep going on the offensive line here. Mm -hmm. um, some names. I know that you've been very impressed by Jalen Duncan out there. Uh, he's had some hype coming in this off season from Maryland, a uh, really good athlete, probably more of an outside zone kind of guy. Uh, Jalen Duncan, Maryland wax poetic about him for a second. Cause I know you love him. Yeah. He, he's six, five and a half, 298 pounds. So his, you know, he, he's light, so to speak. And I put that in quotes for, uh, after the fact, if you're listening after on the pod, um, he's, he's a little, you know, considered light, but he looks it, you know, he, he's got just a spring and a step out there. He's just a little bit lighter on his feet than everybody else. Great athlete. You are not beating him to the outside. I know that uh, Keon White has tried. They have got zebra technology on these guys this year, where it's basically um, they have GPS on them. Keon White's top speed was 17 and a half. I think the next closest guy was in the 15s. The number two guy at defensive line was closer to fifth than he was to first. So Keon White is 280 pounds and an athlete and a half. He he couldn't get around uh Jalen Duncan on the outside. Jalen just shuffled and let him keep right on going. So uh, mm -hmm. love his feet, love his tools. We'll see how he holds up and uh, if he can move guys in the running game as much, but I think he's been very good. Well, awesome. Any other offensive linemen that stick out to you? You got Cody Mock. He's been an interesting one out there. Blake, uh, Blake Freeland from BYU has been a name some people have called out uh, that is maybe one of interest. Uh, Wanya Morris is one that I've been debating for the Broncos. Maybe they're round three, round four, mm -hmm. former five-star uh, recruit at Oklahoma, transferred from Tennessee out to uh, the out to Oklahoma. And then also Matthew Bergeron. Uh, so a bunch of names there. Anybody there that stood out to you? Cody Mock's been really good. He's been at guard, uh, 6'5", 305, and he's been playing uh, right guard, and he looks really good doing it. Um, one guy, I, I actually tweeted about him yesterday, Asim Richards, UNC, 6'4", 307. Every time I look at him, he's doing something right. Um, mm -hmm. I loved him on day one, and then I was watching the skill guys and just they're, while they're doing one-on-ones over on the other side of the field, and I'm like, it just kills me. I want to go watch the trenches, but I need to get the skill guys on video. Because y'all are going to ask me about them, too. Mm -hmm. uh, every time I glance over between reps, Asheem Richards was just doing something right. Um, Blake Freeland had a good bounce back day. Offensive tackle from uh, BYU. Why do I want to say TCU? Is it BYU? Uh, break Blake Freeland. I've lost him. Where'd he go? Yeah, it says BYU. Six, seven and a half, three, twelve. So lean. I, uh, I just... He really, really struggled on day one. I thought he had a better day two. He's he reminds me a little bit of Max Mitchell coming in. You know who came in? Nick is this guy going to be in the first yeah. round? I'm like, dude, I wouldn't draft him, let alone first round. Yeah. I think he's he's struggling just a little bit. So some of the guys on there, um, we could go on and on. <laughs> Cody Mock, I really liked uh, on the other team back on the American team. Osiris Torrance has been solid. Um, Matthew I don't Bergeron know about Matthew been, Bergeron. Yeah, yeah, Matthew Bergeron has been has been okay. Uh, Syracuse left tackle, big number 60, 6'5", 323. He's held his own out here. Uh, I have not been as impressed with the guys on the right side, which has been Wanya Morris and Warren McClendon, Oklahoma and Georgia, respectively. They've been okay. They haven't been uh, standouts for me to, uh, to the same extent. All right, we'll move on to another position here in a minute. Uh, but yes, uh, we got Ethan coming in saying, Nick, you're wondering about Michael Thomas and his cap hit. Saints, uh, it was a glitch. I knew there was something in there that I was missing uh, when I clicked on just the boilerplate, you know, click the X on that. And then it's like, how much dead cap? Like, oh, that's a massive one. Um, the 2024 roster bonus, which is probably being accounted for there, um, of 32 million becomes fully guaranteed on 317. Safe to say they'll cut or restructure. <laughs> Saints and restructuring, man, they love it. We'll see what happens uh, with him. And if he becomes available, him, Brandon Cooks, I mean, wouldn't be shocked to see one of those guys in Denver and the Broncos maybe move on from somebody else. I can't imagine they're going to overload on the the wide receiver side of things with their current guys, given they need defensive line and offensive line help. But uh, you never know. It's, it's got to be cheap. It's, yeah. it, it does. I mean, Michael Thomas hasn't played healthy in God knows how long. It, it feels like 
says he wanted to go out with Breeze. He wanted to be on the field with Breeze's last game, so he delayed surgery, but it, it hampered him. He hurt his foot like week one that year. So it's been really a full two years since he's been out there healthy. Hmm. Well, is is what it is, what it is, I guess. Uh, I want to ask a little bit about running backs. Obviously, this isn't real, always Real the quick, best. let me hit on Aki Dragon because yeah. uh, Dragon, I think he asked us earlier. He says, have you paid any attention to Nick Saldaveri? Um, I know how to spell these guys' names because I wrote all those titles out, going blind, doing it on – 120 clips. Um, he looked good in your film. I thought so too. Um, I thought he looked good athletically. Uh, my concern is at the point of attack. He was really good laterally and getting in front of people, uh, but he wasn't as good at holding his ground. Strength mm -hmm. is easier. He had decent leverage and decent feet. That's the kind of thing that might hold him back some as far as how high do you draft him? How high can you contribute early? But 6'6", 3'11", I think you've got I expect him to test pretty well. I, 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 the way he moved laterally, I expect him to have a pretty good L cone and a shuttle at six six three eleven. If he's got some good feet, I'm willing to work. His point of attack strength needs some work, but strength is a whole lot easier to improve than good feet on a guy that's six foot six, three hundred and eleven pounds. And uh, yes, Quentin Caldwell, it was, it was ODU, Old Dominion. Yep, uh, it's Old Dominion, small school out there uh, in the East Coast, I believe. Uh, we got uh, – I want to ask a little bit about running backs. I haven't talked about that at all. I know that running backs is not the best uh, format out there, but there's some names out there that are worth checking in on. Uh, Chase Brown from Illinois, a good outside zone scheme guy. Rashawn Johnson at Texas. Apparently he's been wearing a Texas Tech helmet out there, but he's – No, that was, a, that was a switch. He broke his hand. So oh. they brought in a guy from Texas Tech. So okay. Roshan had a good first day, and then he uh, he broke his hand. So he's, oh, he's done for the week, and they brought in a Texas Tech kid as a call-up. And they may have had him in the same uh, jersey number, which, hell, he may have had the same uniform just yeah. coming up there real quick. But it was a Texas Tech running back. I didn't get his name. Um, okay. The Georgia running back had a huge run. Kenny McIntosh. Uh, Kenny McIntosh had a really good burst. Brown has looked pretty good. Um, I, again, it's, not, it's not a great format for running backs, and but I yeah. will watch my seven-on-seven -seven stuff starting uh, tomorrow and today. Okay, I know the American running backs, I think a lot more talent here that interests me. Uh, you mentioned Kenny McIntosh, Chris Rodriguez from uh, Kentucky, a huge back, not the most explosive, but he breaks tackles every time he touches the yeah, ball. I don't remember seeing him. Okay, he's this is probably not the best format for him because he's a definitely a plotter type. Uh, Eric Gray from Oklahoma, and then Tajay Spears did a really good job at uh, Tulane and scored like crazy amount of touchdowns every year down there for the uh, the Green Wave. So those are yeah, running the backs. The one that really caught my eye was Kenny McIntosh coming in at – Five, oh, just right at five, right at six foot, uh, 210 okay. pounds. Um, he, he didn't look that big to me, and that's a compliment. You know, when we talk okay. about, you know, he 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 ran like a scat back, like a skied back, uh, a speed back. And at six foot 210, uh, okay, I'm interested. Uh, on the wide receiver side of things, yeah. Um, Jonathan Mingo was a guy that, uh, you know, we're looking for those body types now. He's like Ole six Miss. foot 220 out of Ole Miss. Yeah. And just real easy catching the ball. You know, how do I how do I get this big running back body involved? It seems to be the the new thing with mm -hmm. you know who's the next Debo, who's the next Cordell Cordell Patterson. If teams are gonna play light box factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If teams are gonna play light box then you're gonna give it's Andy Reid has shifted to this dramatically. They trade Tyree Kill and they bring in these guys who are built like running backs, get them the ball quickly, and make the defensive backs tackle in space. It's just the where we're at right now. I undersold him. Um, he was six six one and three eight, so six one and a half, two twenty six. He's thick. I under uh, and he's and he's just real, real easy catching the ball, you know. So it, that's a that's a weapon I want to try and and then uh, Tank has probably been the buzz. Um, what is Tank's actual name? Tank Kid from Dell. Houston. Tank Dell. Dell. Yeah, Tank Dell. They're gonna find ways to get. He's a He's your find your the perfect Oregon slot back. Mm -hmm. uh, find him, get him in space, and let him go to work. He's a jitterbug out here. Now, how long does that last when you're allowed to start planting these guys in the ground? We'll see. But he had a pretty good year this year. I think he's been one of the more exciting guys out here too. Awesome. And we got uh, coming in a little bit late. That's okay. We're running a little long because we're doing the draft stuff here. Um, Epic Gamer, I'm late. God bless. And we're going to keep going here for a little bit. I'm going to go a few more wide receiver names here, Scott. Uh, for me, this ones that I came into this with some curiosity. Uh, Ronnie Bell from Michigan. 
Michael Wilson from Stanford and Trey Palmer from Nebraska. Some guys that I've watched over the years. Any of those guys stand out to you? I haven't watched them as closely yet. I uh, yesterday I finished my one on ones with the linemen last night. Uh, so I haven't watched my seven on seven video. I watched that through a viewfinder about this big. So, um, and I get to watch it on glorious 4k when I'm going through it. So I haven't watched those again, just on the hoof Mingo caught my eye because I'm like, okay, there's your big body mismatch weapon in the backfield. We talked about the size guys, right? Nick, last mm-hmm. night we lamented the loss of the tight end. Well, now instead of 6'6", 240, 250 guys, we're coming in that the mismatch now seems to be that 6'1", 230 guy mm-hmm. that you're getting. That it's, it's kind of a hybrid tight end almost with this size that has the mm-hmm. ability of a running back and a wide receiver that we're putting in there. So that was one of the guys. Uh, my Princeton guy. Um, Andre Yosevis. Okay. Yeah, Yosevis. Uh, Andre Yosevis from Princeton. He looked okay. Uh, I don't think he's quite ready to work against press coverage, you know, comparatively mm-hmm. speaking. He, he's, but he's still good in contested catches. But as far as the the nuances of beating better competition at corners, he's going to have to learn that a little bit. But he's six three and an Olympic caliber decathlete and all kinds of uh, physical tools, and he's he catches the ball very very well, very naturally, and can still get the contested catches. So. There'll be something there for sure. And two more names, wide receiver, Rasheed Rice, SMU, and Dontavian Wicks. I know Rasheed Rice came in maybe the highest rated wide receiver coming to this, but I've, I've heard he's disappointed um, out there. Hasn't looked very, just like a very good athlete in any way. Yeah, they didn't they didn't jump out at me, but that doesn't mean they won't again. Yeah. I'll, I'll go back through this again over the course of the next week or so. Like I said, I mean, I'll have highlight videos, I think, Last year, I did 70 to 75, at least one-minute clips on the players mm-hmm. that were here. So, uh, unfortunately, I might miss Roshan because he was only here one day. Yeah, is what it is. Uh, Jeffrey, Joff Rigby coming in. Jeff Rigby uh, saying, long time watcher, first time commenter. Keep up the great work, guys. Uh, greetings from Canada, up north there. Uh, hope you're doing well, Jeff. Appreciate you coming in and uh, resp- talking on here. We appreciate everybody coming and joining the community. Tight end, Scott, you've mentioned before, Luke Musgrave has really caught your eye out there. Uh, tight end from Oregon State. He might end up being the first tight end off the board. Some other names in this class that uh, intrigue me there. Uh, Durham Payne, more of a wide tight end, but maybe you could be had round four, round five from Purdue. Uh, Josh Wiley, kind of an H-back uh, tight end out there at Cincinnati. And then on the uh, American side of things, Cameron Latu, tight end from Alabama. And then I'm really interested in Braden Willis as more of a fullback transition at the next level. Uh, head coach Brent Venables um, out there at Oklahoma, like could not stop talking about uh, that uh, Willis from Oklahoma, talking about him as a fullback tight end and a special teams contributor. Expect to see him in like round six of one of my mocks at some point, because I want the Broncos to add some talent at that spot. At one point, I think every single one of those guys did something that caught my attention. It's a great at tight some end point. The Oklahoma, the Oklahoma kid uh, was running a little seam route, a little skinny post. And the ball is just a shade overthrown. And he reaches up with one hand and just kind of bats the ball, stops it in midair, and then lets it drop into his hands. It's like, mm. wow, <laughs> that was impressive. Yeah. Um, that was really kind of cool. I'm not sure I've ever seen that before. Didn't George um, Kittle do that in the playoffs versus the Cowboys? He batted it up on a seam route and then caught I mean, it. He didn't even bat it up. It was almost yeah. like, I'm just going to stop it where it is and then run under it. It was, mm. you know, it was – it was really cool. Okay. Um, and then uh, let's see who you said uh, was Musgrave. Uh, Ma- has been Mallory also. Um, Mallory. Interesting. Mallory. Will Mallory from Miami had a nice diving catch. One of the best catches of the day. Um, and Musgrave is huge. He just, he looks big. I think he, if he's not bigger than everybody out there, he certainly looks it. He's six, five and a half. Yeah. And the next, the next closest tight end is, is six, four and three, eight. So he's got a full inch on everybody else out there and at least 10 pounds on everybody else out there. And he's, he's good size, good size, very, very natural, very fluid out there. What did Durham Payne come in at? Durham Payne. I thought he was pretty big. Well, I'm, that was one team. Oh, okay. Um, What number, what, which team, who's Durham Payne? Durham Payne tight end from Purdue uh, on the national team. On the national team. He must have a strange number because he's not listed with the other two tight ends. Okay. I don't have him listed as a measurement. I got Josh Weil and Davis Allen. 
I can look it up. Um, and Scott, Payne we got Durham. Right. That's why. Tied at 6'5", 258. Yep, 6'5", 258. He's a big boy <laughs> out there. And so he's 87 he there. They squeezed a, a, a – they squoze a, a wide receiver between those. It's kind of nice how they do that. They put all the position guys – in one in one spot so it's easy to copy and paste then he coming in coming in broncos orange wars this morning says best duo on mhh appreciate it right now we're the only duo on mhh are probably sick of us probably looking forward to seeing zach and chad tonight it'll be the first time that they've been on since the new hire so that'll be a lot of fun tonight most accurate info and viewpoints delivered in a respectful and responsible way voices of reason among a lot of drama well thank you denny um i have loved working with nick and thanks to chad for setting this up you know, I hit him up about, hey, why don't we do a drive time? You know, this is why don't we do a drive time show? We could do one in the morning. Works best for me anyway, because I'm out with my kids sports at night all the time. Anyhow, and MHH is doing this. And he goes, I think I got a guy you'd like to work with. And and, and he was right. Nick, Chad nailed it. I've absolutely loved working with Nick. I'll have to meet you someday in person, Nick. We've never actually met. <laughs> I'm actually just a deep fake. Um, this is all AI generated. AI, very cool. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what technology can do today. You think they'd uh, remove the gap from my teeth up front here if, uh, if they were working on that AI, but it's maybe it's a little bit more realistic. You know, guy from, oh, he lives in Seattle and hikes and works in science and has a golden retriever. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that sounds like a basic ass bro if I've ever heard one. Well, um, we, but uh, We appreciate you, you coming in like this and giving us the opportunity to be doing this for two years, Nick. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've had a lot of fun too. Yeah. Uh, appreciate uh you coming in and doing the morning shows i mean gosh it's been a time slot it's like it's, chad it's like you think you could wake up at 5 30 to do a show that early i'm like i'm up that early to catch a sunrise hike anyway or walk the dog why not i'll, I'll i love doing the uh audio format stuff maybe much to chad's uh dismay considering it takes up more of my time than the writing but uh this is it's a lot of fun i really appreciate it and at some point we will definitely uh hook up and uh meet up at a bronco game or something of the sort uh we got jeremy coming in saying AI who splits spits out analytics in inappropriate terms. All my terms were appropriate. You guys just have dirty minds in the gutter. Um, so it just, I, it's not my fault that, you know, we're talking about tight ends and filling gaps and, you know, meeting at the hole and everything. Uh, like I that. tell you the hardest one to watch is probably women's soccer. Yeah. For, uh, for the 15 year old adolescent brain that is stuck in my head. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> same. Okay. Defense side of the ball. We're running really long. Um, <laughs> Got to keep us back on track here. We're going to uh, do this on Monday, Nick. I'm, t- I'm telling you right now, we're probably going to go 90 weekend. minutes on Monday on a full review. Okay. Um, well, we'll, we'll be able to go through all this uh, much more in depth too. So just programming note, because Nick and I are both going to be out of town next week, but we will both be here Monday. I think you're here Tuesday morning. I'll be here Tuesday, but Monday will be my last show for a week. And we'll probably go 90, mon- 90 minutes on a senior bowl deep dive. Yep. Are we just gonna are we just gonna combine both shows on maybe. Monday? Yeah, okay. maybe. That sounds good to me. I'll be out from the eighth to the fourteenth and fifteenth morning as well. So uh, gonna be in Hawaii. Uh, gonna be a great time. Um, and Kathy says, "Don't worry, Nick. If the Broncos ever play in Germany, I will welcome you." Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Coach Chris come in and if you keep the show running, they will come. I'm saying uh, I've been away for a while. Good to get back to you guys. Good to have you in here, Chris. We appreciate you uh, saying Peyton can't be any worse than the last five coaches we've had. looks like more and more like Ibero is going to be gone, which sucks, but it's good to be a Broncos fan. Yeah. Wishing nothing but the best for Giro Evero. Uh, appreciate what he did this season. One year. I mean, he kept that defense side of the ball humming, which many of us said, that, including me, it would be a damn her uh, damn hard task considering moving on from Vic Fangio. Obviously I think the pieces he had this season were slightly better than what Fangio had uh, over his tenure in Denver. But I mean, what he did with the penny front, what he was able to do on third down, what he did with Scott plug your ears, uh, simulated pressures up front to generate matchups for uh, players. Uh, he, he was phenomenal and he's going to be a good coach in this league for a long time. And I would, I would reckon eventually a head coach. Maybe this is a year early, but Damn impressive. Really enjoy your ever. Yeah, that's so a thanks, trade coach. you have to make, uh, Coach Chris. Glad to see you back in here. Um, welcome back in. It's a it's a trade you're you're willing to make. Um, you know, Evero is a one year defensive coordinator, and Sean Payton is as close to a sure thing as a head coach as you can get, and was definitely the most accomplished NFL head coach in this cycle, without a doubt. Um, so I agree. You wanted to talk a little bit of defense before we got going. And I have to pack up yes. all my stuff and get out of here today at some point. So I'm yeah, checking out today. I, 
I want to hear the defensive guys. Um, just give me a, a couple names here. We're going to go over a lot of it. Yeah, we are going late today. It's because we have the senior bowl and all the Broncos stuff here. And I'm like, I'm curious because I have not, I've been so busy with the work and Sean Payton stuff that I haven't had a chance to really watch these guys. So I'm, I'm going to hear what Scott has to say. Defensive line, anybody stand out interior or edge that it's really been like, okay, this is a dude. Yeah. Um, let me start on the American side of things and let me resort by position here. Cause like I said, I've got them all in my brain, all scrambled up and it helps me to, uh, helps me to pull names out of there. So we'll sort this by position. And it sorts Keon like White. They put them all in DL. Keon White yesterday, we talked a little bit about him. He's a, I don't know what he is. He's a, a physical force is what he is, mm-hmm. but he is, uh, he came in measured at 280 pounds. And he was, let's see, what number was he? Six. Keon mm-hmm. White was six foot four and three quarters. So just call it six foot five, 280. And he was playing defensive end like he was a 245 pound Nick Benito. Like he was a speed rusher. Like he didn't know what else to do except use his speed. And you can watch it on, he's on the national team. So if you go to OLDL and you watch the highlights, uh, and it's not even just highlights, it's basically every freaking rep, but somebody had to win or lose or it was a stalemate. So it was kind of the highlights. He tries to go outside every time. Every time he's going outside, he's trying to beat people with speed. The fact that he can do that at 280 pounds is amazing. Yeah. Um, the fact that, that that's all he's doing is going to explain, okay, why isn't this guy higher? Because, you know, I want him to go work with with Chuck Smith, Dr. Pass Rush uh, in Atlanta and, and learn how to refine the technique and do all those other things that are very teachable. Six foot five, 280 pounds. And again, they've, they've got GPS on all these guys this week. His time was like 17 and a half miles per hour. They put the type, top speeds out there for all the different positions was 17 and a half. The next closest at number two was 15 and a half. And number five, they just put the top five on there. It was like 14 and a half. There was a two second gap between one and two and only a one second gap between two and five. He's a very intriguing prospect. He is the type that will get drafted and will struggle in his first year. Will be a situation when people say he's a bust. Give him time. Give him time. I'm I'm very interested in what he's going to be able to do. Ball of clay, no doubt about that. Uh, any anything on the Byron Youngs out there on the American team? You have Byron Young, edge rusher, and Byron Young, Alabama interior defensive lineman. Uh, both of those probably day two players. Yeah, I think that's about right. Um, you're talking about Byron Young, Tennessee was a little bit lighter. Um, mm-hmm. Byron Young, uh, Alabama, interior guy, a little bit, a little bit heavier. They were okay. I wouldn't say they were um, they were great. Why is that? I can only find one. Tennessee was six two and a, and six two and a quarter, two forty eight, and then Alabama was six three, two ninety seven. So different body types. Um, Byron Young, Alabama, seemed to me a little bit of an undersized nose guard rather than the quickness of defensive tackle. So we'll see where, where they end up going with that one. Okay. sounds good. And we'll get some more guys from around defensive backs. Um, I heard that uh, my guy, Riley Moss was super impressive yesterday. I was listening to Daniel Jeremiah talk about him saying he's a day two player and he's expecting him to run about a four, three, five would be very interesting. He'd be the first uh, Caucasian cornerback out there in the NFL for a, uh, a good bit. Um, But uh, he's a track athlete and played a lot of snaps at the university of Iowa and they've, done a pretty good job at turning out some uh, defensive backs to the NFL level. I can't tell you who's who except for one guy. Okay. Um, you know, I saw there was, I think there's two Illinois guys out here that were good or that one of them seemed to be better than the other, but I saw Illinois a lot. I saw Iowa a lot. But the one guy I know and shout out to uh, Kevin over on the Falcoholic who I spent some time with. He was, he was, he watched the skill guys a little bit more than I did. And it was KYU, what's his name? You know, Kai Blue Kelly out of Stanford. Oh, yeah. Was the guy. That even was better the than, guy. Even better than Julius Brents, um, who he, I, from he what, was the guy yesterday. Now, whether he ends up being the guy moving forward, Blue was the top guy yesterday. And it was either team pretty substantially. <laughs> okay. Well, I liked him a good bit at Stanford. Um, good length, a good player. I thought he was better two years ago than last season uh, out there at Stanford when I watched them, but interesting. Well, we're going to get a chance to talk about this more and more. We're at an hour and 20. I got to get going and walking the dog and everything like that, but I appreciate you guys. Scott's got work to do as well. And uh, last show for a bit, we'll see you guys again on Monday. Make sure you're following Scott and I on Twitter. Scott is at Scott Kennedy. I'm at Nick Kendall MHH. Uh, as that ticker saying underneath there, if you guys are watching on Facebook, please click the thumbs up. If you feel like we've earned it, uh, we appreciate everyone coming to the super chats and superstars, but 
completely free to click the thumbs up on the way in and are on the way out. Uh, we really appreciate that. Also follow us at MHH pod at uh, BFB underscore pod and at mile high huddle. If you haven't done so yet, if you are joining us on Facebook, uh, make sure you're liking our p- Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash mile high huddle and facebook.com forward slash mile high huddle pod. And as that ticker says underneath there, YouTube folks, please click the thumbs up, subscribe to the mile high huddle page and uh, share it on all your platforms and click that bell. So that way, you know, when we go live, Scott and I are a little bit better about uh, how uh, consistent we are with our start time. Uh, but that bell notification can save you guys a, a good bit of time waiting. Cause then you can just say, Oh, it's a, uh, just for example, no reason at all, but it's Chad and Zach tonight. Um, they started 25 minutes late. Well, now I'm not with sitting here waiting for 25 minutes. The bell told me uh, that they were on. And uh, the chat's open early. They we, yeah. we build the rooms. They typically build the rooms a little early. I think of their start time as 8.15 Eastern, 6.15. Anything later than that, then they're late. They're not late until yeah. 15 after because they're pretty pretty consistent. Michael Rankio comes and says, great, to, great show today, Nick and Scott on Broncos for Breakfast. And he's coming in. He come in with the type of stars that, that, that Michael's come in with. It gets a different color. Mm-hmm. I wish we could show that on here. It'd be kind of cool. Just to really show, all we can do is say thank you, Michael, for this the, the support that you've shown us from the beginning. Nick mm-hmm. and I are on a couple different channels, a couple different shows. You're always in there with us, always helping us out. Here's a salute to you, my friend. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you guys so much. We appreciate you. Also saw a funny comment coming in here from Andre saying, Nick, I always thought you were a cat person. I am a cat person. I'm also a dog person. I'm a every single animal type of person. I, I guess not every single animal. I don't love all uh, insects and whatnot. I have mosquitoes. A, <laughs> okay. It's not mosquitoes for me. I don't like mosquitoes. I probably legitimately have a phobia of uh, ticks. Um, being in infectious disease epidemiology and zoonotic diseases, if I even see like a picture of a tick or anything, I like turn white and like feel like I'm going to pass out. Uh, I, I hate, <laughs> hate ticks so much. Um, On that note, everybody. God, I hate them. Um, yeah, I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, you guys have a great one. Uh, as Jeremy says, F them mosquitoes. Yeah, number one killer of anything in Africa. Not great. Um, I love snakes. Yeah, snakes are cool. I, I love snakes. I feel bad for the snakes that everybody just immediately starts to kill them. Ticks, I mean, snakes are wonderful for the environment. I've got, yeah. um, I've never, I, I guess I have seen one. I, I didn't know I saw it at the time because they were all together. We got, I guess, I got a bunch of copperheads in my yard. That's why I don't let my cats out anymore, though. I've got a couple of cats, like those curious things that end up getting swooped up by an owl or a hawk. But I've got a couple of really big eastern king snakes have gone through my yard that are just amazing. And some big rat snakes. I love the snakes. They're, I'd rather, much rather have the snakes than uh, the stuff that the snakes eat. Possums are great too. Just yep. stay out of my yard. The raccoon got in my attic one time when I lived in New Jersey. That was those things are pretty nasty nick yeah they are they're cute um but uh it's like buddy the elf you know do you want a hug <sighs> six them and whatnot so yeah don't don't get too close to those guys um but appreciate you guys we're way off the rails now uh you guys have a great rest of the day i'm gonna let scott get going uh we will see you guys again snake sorry i was trying to click off stop my it hand, my hands are off the wheel scott colin wood snake question mark um and uh we're gonna get out of here continue to choose kindness and compassion as i always like to say have a great rest of your week have a good weekend everyone go broncos